All right. Welcome, everyone, to our monthly CG Lab Talk series. It's a great pleasure to introduce Wolfgang Eigner to you. Wolfgang did his PhD at TU Vienna, and he's now a scientific director of the Institute of Creative Media Technologies at St. Bertin University of Applied Sciences. Wolfgang is also a young professor at TU Vienna, TU Vienna still, and Wolfgang is an expert um, in the field of information visualization and visual analytics, and in particular, um, in the topic of time series data visualization, and he wrote a, a really great book about uh, time visualization. And I'm looking forward to your talk. I, I think the same is true for, um, for everyone who is here, and we also have the remote audience uh, in the recordings. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure also to be here and uh, give you an overview of, of research we did lately and coming back to a place where I actually started my computer science career like more than 20 years ago already. I started to study computer science here at this university, so um, it's nice to be here again. Um, uh, but back to, to the actual research or more to a very practical application scenario. So imagine you have knee problems. So your knee is hurting for like the last two or three weeks and it comes bugging you that there could be something wrong with your knee and you go see your general practitioner who does some lab tests on you or lets you do some, some exercises. And she isn't quite sure so what, what the problem could be. And so she'll be, she basically gives you two options. So you either mm -hmm. go to a specialist clinic um, to get some some intense checks there or you could see a, a physiotherapist so for the first option that's basically a setup that's maybe similar to this one so you have these uh, uh, pressure um, um, plate setups here with some very expensive hardware equipment and also analysis software uh, that gives you in-depth analysis possibilities to really um, give you more uh, information and, and support the diagnosis. Uh, so the good thing is all the technologies there, the experts are there. The problem here is that it takes ages that you get an appointment there, so a couple of months probably, because there are not so many specialist things out there, the waiting list is long, so it takes a long time um, for you to get an appointment there. And here you see what, what's actually done here, so you have these pressure plates, uh, force plates here on the floor where you uh, walk over there and you have a number of different timer and parameters that are recorded. There is analysis software that um, helps you um, to find out insights about that data and gives you hints to the diagnosis. So the second option that I mentioned is um, go see a, a physiotherapist. So the good thing is that you probably will get an appointment within two weeks, so uh, very soon. Uh, the downside is that uh, usually in a physiotherapist's office, so what the physiotherapist does is looking at you basically with her eyes. So you walk in, in front of the physiotherapist, but they are really highly trained specialists. They really can see a lot uh, based um, on this uh, optical um, inspection only. Um, but the other thing is that we ask ourselves, so how can, could we support um, these um, uh, physiotherapists? And there was one uh, project called uh, Sony Gate, uh, where um, we developed some um, hardware and also software to support this. And this is the actual prototype, uh, so the working prototype of such a sensor sole uh, that have, has all, uh, also been um, produced um, in this research project. So the, the whole uh, sensor is in the sole, so I can give you uh, this to have a look at it. Um, and uh, what it basically does is you put that sensor sole in your shoe, you're walking, and you have these um, pressure sensors inside the sole, and they are uh, recording uh, pressure data. The pressure data is sent wirelessly um, to a uh, mobile device here, uh, a tablet. Uh, the data that uh, is transmitted in real time gets processed there uh, and gets sent back uh, also wirelessly to a Bluetooth headphone there and you get your own gait basically sonified. So you hear how you are walking, so if there's a difference between your left foot and your, your right foot, for example, so when, and, and things like that. So it helps you in there. And so the thing is, we have the hardware now that uh, is able to get you some good data. It's not exactly the same as the gold standard system that I uh, showed you just before, but it's good enough that it gives you an advantage over uh, uh, optical. 
ecological inspection only. The thing is the data that you get in, so that's a real cut out of some data rows that you get out of these sensors. So that's where we uh, are here at. So how can we make this data interpretable by the domain experts? And there, that's where visualization and visual analytics comes in. So as visual analytics is defined as to combine automated analysis techniques with interactive visualizations for an effective understanding, reasoning, and decision making on the basis of very large and complex data sets, which is one of the definitions there. So that's where we feel home, right? So we have these all this complex data. So we, we go out in our lab, we analyze the data, we have these uh, multivariate time around the data sets. Uh, and we uh, put together a nice prototype where we use some well-known visualization techniques like light plots or also some, some more advanced ones like the horizon graphs up there where we make more effective use of the available screen space. So that's our realm, so make these complex data sets better understandable. And what we do in the next step is go to our domain experts and, and show a nice tool to them and um, hope that they will be very happy about it and maybe get a look like this. So because we totally got it wrong, so we just displayed the data there, but we didn't take into account some parameters that are derived from the actual uh, values that are recorded there, or that they actually don't look at all these unrounded cycles one after the other, but they do combine cycles into one. So things that we couldn't know just looking at the data. So it's reminded me a little bit of what I, I read in a book as the, the motto of the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933, which says science finds, industry applies, and man conforms. So we better use the tool and be happy with it. Uh, what I want to say is that it's not enough to only look at the data. We also need to have a look at our users, our audience, who they are, what they want, and what they want to do and achieve and the tasks and the goals. Only if we look at all these things together, we can do something that's eventually useful to those uh, who will apply our uh, technologies. Um, and there is a concrete example also that applied this um, principle is a research project called Color Time, uh, it's, uh, funded by the uh, FWF. Um, and uh, the goal of the project, which is um, uh, called Knowledge Assisted Visual Analytics Networks, Time on the Data. So, the basic idea is that um, if you look at data, if you interpret some domain data, you need also a lot of background knowledge. So, you only are able to really make sense of it if you know something about the domain, how to interpret the data. And our assumption was if we are successful in uh, ex Internalizing some of that knowledge that in, is in the brain of the domain expert, we can make the visualization better. So, if we can use uh, just a simple example, so if you do a line plot of body temperature as a physician, I might know that body temperature of 38 point something is slightly elevated. And if we have that knowledge in the system, we would be able to point at that point in time to use color to highlight a section like that. So we can make the visualization better and more easily interpretable by the human experts. So that was the basic assumption of the project. And what he applied um, is there also some kind of human-centered design cycle here, starting with problem analysis, data gathering, wrangling, conceptual design, computation, deployment, and a lot of validation and evaluation cycles beginning in between at the end to evaluate all the steps that we do here in between and what we concretely did in this use case of, of the, the gate data is you know, as a first step a problem analysis where we did focus group interviews to learn about the users how they actually do such analysis sessions when they have patients what they actually look at what's the data what are the parameters they, they can deal with uh, what is the, the usual basis um, of their uh, diagnosis and the uh, data analysis tasks. In the second step, we went on doing uh, conceptual designs that's done mostly on paper, basically so paper scribbles or using some other interfaces that we think might fit, uh, exchanging parts, doing some um, also better renderings uh, using using graphic software, but it's basically non-functional. It's, it's, it's about getting the concepts right. And also as a next step, already going uh, for a review, going in this case, we did expert reviews, which with HCI experts, 
having um, asked uh, three of them uh, through a guided process there uh, about the user interface, about the issues there, got all of ready feedback and, uh, and uh, improved our conceptual design. And that's, that's another um, um, slide that, that shows the basic idea is that we wanted to have some, some notion of transferring some of the, or modeling some of the domain knowledge also in the system that helps you um, again in analysis. And that's kind of the um, end product after um, these cycles here in user-centered design is one more or less complex looking interface, it's an expert interface after all, uh, that supports the tasks of uh, the physiotherapist in, in this case. And uh, we did a functional implementation um, of this and a functional prototype. And I'll just give you a glimpse uh, using this uh, video of how this actually works. This is the intro video to navigate together a knowledge assisted visual analytic solution for data analysis. Clinical gate analysis typically two force plates are used to quantify ground reaction forces. Clinicians use these information for the clinical decision making. A typical recording of ground reaction forces consists of three components. The green waveform represents the vertical component, the red waveform the anterior posterior shear forces, and the purple waveform the medial-lateral shear. From these data, typically a vast amount of parameters are calculated, which need to be interpreted by a clinician in a short period of time. Thus, systems based on knowledge-assisted visual analytics may be the potential to support in this challenging task. Carbogate allows to load newly recorded gate data and also allows to explore already stored gate records of different patients. One key element of Cavagate is the EPS, the Explicit Knowledge Store, which allows the clinician to inspect the store. These data typically comprise the ground reaction for waveforms and corresponding spatial temporal parameters. In addition, these parameters are categorized by the EPS by different gate pathologies or functional impairments. These categories are illustrated in the graphical summary. This summary shows an overview of all of the 16 calculated special temporal parameters of each patient. The display data in the EPS can be filtered by gender, body height, and body mass. With regards to the actual display patient record, a matching criteria is shown as well in this summary. This matching criteria shows a correlation of the actually displayed gate records to existing gate impairment categories stored in the EPS. By clicking on one category in the EPS, details will be displayed on demand on the right side of the screen. These details are displayed as so-called interactive twin box plots, which allow detailed exploration and comparison. Cavagate also allows for knowledge exploration. That's enough for the moment. So the basic idea is um, that it helps you in doing your diagnosis. So you um, do a uh, data recording session using uh, the sensor source, for example. You get these measurements. And what it does is that it's based on the data that's already stored there and all the diagnoses that are already in the system. It gives you some suggestions that you might have had um, patients with similar um, data uh, that hints to some of the categories here, like left knee, hip, something like that, um, would be a suggestion to look at that. And it already gives you some um, visual highlighting, pointing you to some of the gate impairments that, that could be in place with the uh, patient that you look at. So, and more from a conceptual perspective, so, so what you do here is actually you, you have some stored knowledge in there uh, that helps you already do some highlighting, uh, give you a hint where uh, you could uh, have a look at and some, some, some basic ideas for the for the diagnosis, you do some interactive data exploration, and while doing the data exploration, 
as a byproduct, you extend this, this model of knowledge. So you make the system better by using it more. Um, so you have this updated knowledge uh, with a human in the loop process. Basically. What we have here is visualization. You can have automated data analysis components. We have human interaction and uh, knowledge modeling that helps you uh, with these externalized knowledge to improve the uh, visual analytics methods. And uh, as a fourth step to validate our um, proposed uh, system here, we did a validation as a, as a user study with uh, six gate analysis experts, as well as a case study at a, at a, a clinic with a couple of uh, thousand patient records that we were able to load into the system and, and also show how it works uh, based on, on the real system data. And uh, we learned a couple of uh, interesting things here. So the user study was pretty standard, like six participants, predefined tasks. So we asked the participants to perform some of the tasks there. Uh, and afterwards, they did, did interviews on, on how they uh, were doing with the tests. And the second one was this case study with a national expert. And the interesting thing was also for them is that they said that for the first time, so they worked for with that data for case basically. For the first time, using such a visualization tools, they saw things. They always like had a hunch that that would be that the case there. For the first time, they really saw that things that they uh, had hypothesis on were really happening, like. Uh, having several diagnoses at the same time is like what, what they already uh, thought that would happening is if you, for example, have a problem with your knee that later on, if that then you might have a problem with the hip afterwards uh, as well, and that was detected by the system. Because for the first when we looked at, at, at the test data, basically, we thought that if that's a flaw of the system, that couldn't be that those three things are happening at the same time, but it turned out that actually that's very much the case, and that's actually something that was very useful for the for the domain experts. So um, it's what I want to say is that it's very useful to have this uh, human-centered uh, design cycle and process there, and that's only one example of, of where it was helpful and to to learn new things about what we didn't know about the users before. Uh, another project that we're uh, still working on is called Valid or Visual Analytics in Data Driven Journalism. So completely different domain. However, the uh, approach, uh, the research approach, uh, was similar here, uh, also as a human-centered design approach. The goal here is to support uh, the investigation of data journalists, basically for complex data sets. So, um, and as a uh, project together with the University of Vienna and the FIU uh, from uh, the journalism department there and the company Datenhandlung and some associated media partners also um, there as evaluation partners. And the idea here is uh, not so much data journalism in the sense of producing infographics that would be on a web page or, or in, a, in a print magazine, but helping the journalists to analyze the data, to explore something, to find stories. That's the actual idea there, uh, and to pro provide tools for that. Um, so this is one of the of the prototypes we, we did in that project that's called uh, Metflower and that's used for, for analyzing dynamic network data, for example. So what you see here is the Austrian Media Transparency Database giving you information about how much money was spent by a governmental or public organization to some, some media corporation, how that money flows changed over time. Uh, you can interactively explore that, filter that. Um, you can have uh, different data sets in there. We also used it to, to maximize, for example, foreign aid data, so how much money goes uh, for an, in foreign aid to some other countries. Or you could even, even use it, for example, for uh, exploring something like uh, soccer players and how they move between uh, the different clubs and how much money is spent between the clubs there. So there are a lot of different use cases uh, for this kind of data structure. Respect of time, I'll skip the video there. Um, and there's one um, last project that I wanted to uh, just briefly give you a look at, which is called VAST or Virtual Airport and Tower. Uh, again, a very different application domain, um, um, together with the, the company of Kubernetes and Fraunhofer in, in Graz, uh, the project there. Uh, and the idea was there that the, the air traffic controllers, uh, they mainly use visual representations which are really very old. So they're mainly the radar screen, which is the main uh, visual representation often used, has been designed like in the 60s and didn't change much since then. And there are things like 
hate information is only encoded by a number. So you need to interpret, to read a number first, interpret it. So it's not, that would be, of course, slower and would be a, a purely a perceptual task there. Um, and what we did there is uh, that we uh, explored some uh, different representations, but also using 3D, uh, 2D, 3D combined, and also abstract representations, uh, like the one here on the left, uh, where we show um, parameters um, that are extracted basically uh, from, from the flight parameters. And what we also apply here is um, this, again, this human-centered uh, design cycle. It's just a quick overview of the steps that we did there and, and the current state of the project. The high-level goals of CSER require major changes in managing the European air traffic. These changes are one, up to 100% more traffic, two, up to 30% reduction in delays, and three, safety improvement up to a factor of four. For economic optimization, airplanes will be routed along 4D trajectories. Within the research project VAST, the team is developing new methods for visualizing and sonifying air traffic. These should provide the same or better situation awareness, conflict detection, and decision making. To analyze the requirements, the team conducted interviews with stakeholders as well as with air traffic control officers. Raw ideas created in a design studio workshop were aggregated into 12 concepts, which were evaluated by five air traffic control officers. Based on the results, three low fidelity prototypes were developed. VASTD shows the air traffic two dimensionally. Routes can be highlighted by selecting an airplane. Zooming in and out can be done with the mouse. Moreover, visual changes occur for different events, like a loss of separation or a level bust. The second prototype shows a combined 2D and 3D view. Auto zooming can be done by selecting an airplane and pressing Z on the keyboard. Using the arrows up and down on the keyboard changes the camera angle. Using a 3D mouse allows navigating in 3D space to be more convenient. Bass Abstract shows the 2D view with additional information of the airplane's height and its estimated arrival time. Events like a loss of separation or a level bust are shown on both sides of the screen. So what we again apply here is a human centered design process and especially also in this case we learn a lot when talking to these experts. And we also had um, quite difficult experiences because it's a difficult um, application domain, so the, the people working there, they're trained for years, uh, basically. They have tasks which are really, really um, safety critical, and they are very reluctant in uh, accepting any changes to, to what they are used to, and that's very, because of that, the, the tension between you want to introduce some, some new technology there that helps you, and, and the people working in there, uh, on very much on the conservative side, what, what it uh, means about changing, uh, what, what interfaces they use now, that's um, a very hard terrain there. So, and um, as I said, that's an example of, of, of research projects. Um, and um, I'm from the Institute of Creative uh, Media Technologies, where um, we actually have most of the projects uh, that we focus on conducting interdisciplinary research um, on human centered interactive technologies and timeless media to advance science industry in our academic program. So, it's Kind of an overarching uh, model for for many of our projects. So uh, for those of you who don't know where some part of this, it's uh, 45 minutes from Linz and uh, 25 minutes from Vienna. So right in between there. Um, and um, as a uh, research institute, uh, we have three research uh, groups on media computing, media creation, and uh, visual technologies. 
So um, I'm, uh, together with Mark Seidel, I'm heading uh, the, the whole institute. So we're uh, 40 plus researchers in, in the institute and uh, have 25 uh, projects plus minus at any given point on in national, international levels. Um, and I'll skip this one because Mark already mentioned it and uh, go back to our um, like arch of, of research uh, topics that spans like, from more traditional media technology, media production uh, to uh, human centered computing data analysis um, um, parts, uh, all up to uh, media art and, and creative technologies, where we also have uh, research uh, projects that deal with how to apply, for example, um, in augmented, re augmented reality and virtual reality for theater production, so for for actors and, and how that could be used in this kind of arts. And visual computing, of course, is one of the uh, major foci also of the, of the Institute. And we have uh, quite a number of people also working uh, in, in, in that arena and uh, a good number of, of projects. So most of them in uh, the more application-oriented, uh, G-funded uh, project line. Uh, also projects in the basic research uh, by FWF and um, some, some other fundings there. Uh, but going back to what I started on, uh, so going back to our uh, knee problem and uh, the system that we um, developed there, which is called uh, Kawa Gate, by the way, it's uh, a TBCG published article now, will be presented at, at this um, in fall. And uh, the question is, are we done now? So as uh, we were analytics researchers, we have uh, put forward this new concept. We built the system that's obviously helpful for the domain experts. So we, we solved a very, very practical, uh, very concrete problem. The question is, as, as an engineer, they might be very happy now. The question is, are we also happy as scientists? So as scientists, we might also have the, the goal to have some more objective reusable pieces of theory, of, of models. So how can we use what we did here in a more general uh, manner? And on a more general level, even the question is, is visual analytics science? So what, what we usually have uh, broadly uh, categories of different sciences, and like the two main ones are of course like natural sciences and social science, and for natural science, main purpose is to understand complex phenomena, to discover how things are and justify why they are this way. And the research goal is to explore, describe, explain, predict things, how they are. The social science, like the object of study, are uh, people so reflecting on human beings and their actions and interactions. Uh, the research goal would be to explore, describe, explain, and predict again. I think what sets us apart um, in, in visual analytics is um, to have to do something with new artifacts that we are actually also creating. And that's not a new idea. So uh, Herbert Simon uh, already put it up in, in, in the 60s, basically. Uh, and he said, like, the natural sciences are concerned with how things are and design. In the other hand, is concerned with how things ought to be with devising artifacts to attain, attain goals. I think what sets uh, this area apart is also this part of it is to create new artifacts. And, Build them and to, to evaluate them. Um, so, and he came basically up with this notion of uh, design science as a new kind of science um, next to uh, natural science and social science, where the purpose is also to design, to produce systems that do not yet exist, to modify existing situations to achieve better results and focus on solutions, um, which was really also Prescribing research oriented also towards solving problems, not only only quote unquote understanding how things are uh, the way now. Uh, and um, a particularly useful conceptualization of design science um, is, is the one here by I, I have my colleagues. Um, where we have design science research with the goals of developing, building artifacts. And the example I showed you before is basically building an artifact. The question is how do we get to the, the second part here? Also theories, models, reusable pieces here. And we have evaluation um, methods here that refine again theories and artifacts. And we have 
um, outcomes that contribute to the knowledge base, and we are also in this special environment of a particular concrete problem, like in this case, it's analyzing gauge data, for example. So we're not in this completely abstract uh, notion. We have these organizational, these environmental needs, and we also have scientific bases here, pathologies, foundations that we use to build our system. So it's not purely like tool building, it's a scientific way of doing this and getting out not only artifacts, but also these general, generalizable, reusable pieces of theory and models. So what we actually did in, in this research project is not only um, doing the, the clinical gate analysis use case, but also the second use case in, um, in a different domain, the analysis of malware behavior, uh, where we helped domain experts in, in this domain to analyze um, system um, traces, so Windows API calls, and analyze them, doing pattern recognition on them, and finding patterns that hint to malicious behavior of the software um, to help them find those behaviors, and applying the same idea of knowledge extraction, so knowledge systems visual analytics there, and to learn from these more abstract uh, representations of how we can work with that, how a knowledge, additional knowledge, externalized knowledge can help in these two, two cases, basically, and generalized that into a conceptual model of knowledge-assisted visual analytics, um, uh, basically done also by uh, Markus Wagner and Paul of and colleagues. And that's uh, based on a well-known model by Jan van Wijk, and extending that one um, by um, different uh, processes and building blocks here to model this knowledge um, extraction, knowledge usage parts, so that it nicely fits into uh, the um, conceptual underpinnings of, of visual analytics that we uh, know right now. And what we can do with such a model right now, it's not only fun to have such a uh, abstract concept right now, but you can also really use it. So, the, the, the three most important aspects here is that it has descriptive power, evaluative power, and generative power. So descriptive power means that with this kind of, of conceptualization, with this model, we are able to describe a broad range of already existing systems, basically. And we can uh, compare what the one has, what the other doesn't have, and we have a basis for comparison. We have evaluative power, we can assess current solutions, how good they are, how much they exploit, what could be done there. And last but not least, a very important one, generative power. When we build new systems, uh, it's kind of a blueprint on a more abstract layer that we can build upon and see what parts would we need to build such a system, what should we, what should we add uh, to, to use, uh, make most use, use of it. So the main contributions here are, on the one hand, the theory as this knowledge-assisted visual analytics model based on a mathematical and theoretical description uh, that combines these notions of implicit and explicit knowledge and also uh, demonstrated uh, the model um, uh, utility here. And we also created artifacts. So in this notion of design science, artifacts and theories, in this case, two case studies, on one on behavior-based malware analysis and the other on, on clinical <coughs> gate analysis, where we did this human-centered design cycle, starting from problem characterization, abstraction, validation, reflection, and also uh, introduced some uh, new visualization techniques that were um, put into these uh, visual expression interfaces. So, as a conclusion, uh, I am uh, very certain that visual analytics can be seen as a design science discipline, uh, where the idea is to conduct systematic human centered design, development, and validation of artifacts. So, it's a very important part to have a specific problem solving in there, but also not to forget the other part, which is to generate knowledge, models, and also theories that build and extend objective, general, this objective, general. Level generalizable knowledge base uh, that we can all build upon in, in part of research. Okay, so time is up and uh, thank you for the attention. I have to take any questions. Thank you very much. Questions? So, I yes. have a question. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, 
I have a question to regarding CoverGate. Um, mm -hmm. You said that you have you used a user-centered design process and you modeled everything, um, or you had a prototype, a paper prototype. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if you um, have considered also using prototyping tools like Bazamik or Xure or something like this. And if you used it, which one did you use, or if not, why uh, didn't you? Yes, yeah. we, we mainly used paper and pen. Mm -hmm. Basically, for 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 doing this, this mockups and prototypes. I mean, the, the first reason is, I mean, there are a lot of these prototyping tools. We, we use Balsamic, for example, for, for for other projects. The thing is that they are not much of help with any like, visualization techniques or things mm -hmm. like that. So it's more standard user interface components. Everything but the chart or, or mm -hmm. the, the visualization yeah. techniques you can do with that one, but you cannot like integrate also the visualization techniques mm -hmm. there. So and we, the thing with the tools is, is kind of my, 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 my own opinion is that it's often the case that it that limits mm -hmm. on, on your, your ideas and creativity because you, you think through the tool and what the tool can do and, and not what can be done in general. Mm -hmm. And that's much easier on paper. Um, and you're also much faster in many cases. Mm -hmm. and there, there are cases where it's, that the problem is that you don't know how it looks like when the data is in there. So that's that's a different issue. Yeah. But the thing is, as a first step, it, it turned out to be very useful to stay on, on like lo-fi paper prototypes to, to get basic uh, concept right, and and then use other uh, ways of getting quickly uh, a glimpse on how that would look like with data. So not the whole system, but maybe maybe only parts of it, and see okay if, if there are like 1500 data points in there, does it still work? Um, things like that. That's that's a different issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a second. <laughs> um, I have a second question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the example with the air traffic control was pretty interesting. And um, you explained that they are really conservative, which I can imagine. Um, did you, or are, how are these prototypes applied, or are they developed further so that they are using some kind of work, something of your work now, or is it really a research project that uh, it's just for paving the path or something like this? So um, mm -hmm. there, there, there are um, a number of things here. So the the industry itself is is in terms of like introducing new technology is very slowly moving. But mm -hmm. As you can imagine, equipping like an airport with new technologies. Extremely expensive and will be done like every like maybe 20 or 30 years. Mm. Everything is like redone there. There are smaller um, additions to, to existing systems. Um, however, it's, it's slowly moving, but we have um, the one company partner in the project for Ventis. So they're it's a, a, a very large company that's operating um, like internationally in many airports, having introduced these systems. And so they're um, always in terms of to get some kind of demonstrator of what is possible as it's kind of new technology to, for them to show uh, to potential customers mm -hmm. what, what can be done in, in terms of introducing a new technology and what, what are the benefits there because we also have these evolution results and uh, the, the the tests were also done with uh, air traffic controllers and also um, uh, like students of air traffic control so uh, in, in so in, I'm not sure about which which uh, year in, in training already, but not uh, people who are already working. So there were two groups, and we were also interested in is there a different performance mm -hmm. between the real air traffic controllers already in, in, in the job for a couple of years and, and those starting mm -hmm. starting new um, in the job. Um, and the thing is also there's it's very hard to get clear results. Uh, in these evaluations, because when you ask like the, the air traffic controllers, what, what do you like more, or what, where do you think are you faster or more confident with, they tend to stick with what they know, which mm -hmm. is understandable. However, if you if you compare that to what we measured in terms of how quick they were or how many mistakes they made with the one or the other, there were conflicting results because quite a number of times like this abstract view. Uh, which looked a bit like a parallel coordinate representation was much faster to detect like uh, conflicts or things like that. So, mm -hmm. And it's that's not so clear cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.
Hold it. It's the air traffic control system is not to be set with certification. Yeah, that's the agent. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. I, I missed this. What is this? That's a sensor sole. Um, so that that's <coughs> was part of a project. Uh, to have a low-cost alternative to like a uh, gold standard clinical gate plate system you have only in a, a very few number of clinics um, and to have something that is um, much lower in cost that you can hand to a physiotherapist um, in, in her own office and uh, to of course not achieve the same quality because the other one was like 30 plus K uh, and this one maybe like a thousand K uh, would be available on, on in that price category. Uh, but to have some um, additional quality uh, over what they can do right now, where they mainly use visual inspection, like looking at the patient and here we can, can have data. We, there were also already studies on, on comparing the data that we get out of, of the sensor sole with the sensor plate setup we would have in a, in a, in a, in a clinic. And it's that the, the results are very exciting actually um, because we're getting relatively close to, to these gold standard systems. And, and they're already really, uh, if you look at, at these skate curves, um, they are not much different than you would get from the clinical system. So it has pressure sensors? It has a number of pressure sensors in there um, that are distributed um, along, along the sole there. And uh, the, the sensor measurements are then uh, transmitted uh, wirelessly uh, to a device or a server where they're processed. And, and in this one setup, uh, the Sony gate setup, uh, the data then is sent back also to, to headphones um, on, for, for the patient who is, who is wearing the soles. So you get a sonification of, of how you're walking. And you would hear like, if you're walking differently, your left or right foot. And if there are um, other uh, patterns that you can actually hear while you're walking, which is easier than if you look at a display, you can see something like, mm -hmm. like hearing is a, is a different uh, modality works where all of that. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we had it on the, on the slide. Um, so you, I, I tried it also in, uh, I was. Uh, Participant in a user test there, where else to try it? So you put it in your shoe, um, and uh, so the, the transmitter would get um, put on on your leg there. We have some, some elastic band. Uh, we have different sizes, of course. <laughs> it's only one uh, uh, one size we have there. You pick your size, you put it, um, you choose. And do you use data sonification in any other projects? Because I mean, it's, yeah, it, that's that's one. The other one uh, is also this, this air traffic control example. Uh, that's also some um, something where we use sonification. So we had in the experiments also different kinds of sonification, so like 360 degree um, soundscapes, basically. Um, what we uh, sonified there were things like if a new airplane is entering. Uh, this section of one air traffic controller to hear that first and also <coughs> maybe directional information from, from where it comes from. And, and that's a very, very tricky area actually, because as we all know, with these audio alarms, is if you're alarming too often, um, you would turn it off, you tend to not hear it. Um, and when do you start with this audio? I mean, it's the, the thing is that it's a different modality. You can use an additional uh, channel, so to say, to, to transport the data. But you need to be very careful on how you, you design that. And also which sounds you're using. That was also an experiment here. If it's more like it's, it's more like an instrument or it's more abstract, <laughs> like like um, noise, some some kind of, of noise that's that's modulated there. So that's that's also a very interesting uh, research area. But do you consider data sonification also for other of these projects? So if you get a new project that you already say, okay, we can, we now have these data prototypes and we're already thinking about this dimension, where do you think this I mean, we are we're currently on the way of, of trying to integrate even better also like visual analytics or visualization and, and sonification and see how can they... <coughs> 
complement each other. Um, it's not so much of um, uh, comparing what can be done better with the one or the other, but where can, can they complement each other? Where can I do some education to, to add something I can't easily do with the visual channel or the other way around? And, and what, what channels are there, like what we have in, in terms of visualization are, for example, visual variables. So we know what we have there and how, how good they are in, in perceptual manners. Uh, what, what's the what's the combo in the zonification area? What can we use there and, and, and how can we combine those, those areas? These, these are things we're, we're working towards currently. Okay, I have a last question. So, um, actually multiple questions, but I just pick one. So, um, you, you talked about this, this data journalism project. Mm -hmm. Can you just name us some examples uh, that that you've identified in the media transparency data set because that's a pretty interesting data set i guess um was there some interesting findings that you can share i mean uh, we did a number of, of workshops also with with journalists like in, in links also in february for example club of austria and there was a workshop with, uh, with some, yeah, mm -hmm. um, actually and uh, um, what she uh, uses in one case is also you I think it was one or two years ago where there was a change in, in, in the government um, and there was this um, media thing that was like, okay, we will cut the expenses in, in advertisements by whatever. So we'll cut that down and, and what you can try to find out is mm -hmm. was that actually happening. And you, what, what you can see is, is that the data is on the level of quarters of the year. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's coarse. But still, you, you will see that after the change in, in government, the change of chancellor in, in mm -hmm. government, you would see there there would be dip, but it rises again after that. So it was very short that we will see that effect. So that would be one example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there is no other pattern if the government changes that they redistribute the money to some different. And the thing is, uh, what makes it difficult in this case is that the structure changes. So as you know, there is new government elected, so. The ministries would be like uh. either split or or joined again, and you cannot really easily compare. Um, so you, you could like group all the, the ministries, for example, like in, in one group and see at least there is kind of a steady uh -huh. um, outgoing amount of money, or if it is higher like before elections or after or whatever patterns you have. But what I have to say is is that our our goal, I don't see our goal in, in, in really identifying those patterns because we're we're the ones who are providing the means to do so yeah. and the no. journalists, would, they're actually the ones uh, who have these hypotheses and, and, and we want to support them in, in finding these yeah. stories and actually right now uh, we started, uh, I think one or two weeks ago with the phase of, of, um, of case studies basically where journalists at different media outlets in Austria use our tool and they're doing real projects with it. Mm -hmm. and, and they're also doing diaries and, and, and write down what, what they did and, mm -hmm. and, and what worked well, what they found out. And if all works well, they will produce some, some newspaper reports about their findings and get stories out of that. And mm -hmm. we hope to find some, some, some very good insights um, mm -hmm. on how that helps them. Cool. Okay, final question. Okay, then I'm just going to announce our next speaker. It will already be in two weeks from now. We're going to have a remote talk again, given by Eric Reinhardt. Um, he works at Technicolor Research and Innovation in France, and he's talking about simulating high brightness on standard dynamic range screens. And the talk will be on June 19th um, after lunch. Okay, that's it. Um, let's thank Wolfgang again for a really interesting talk. <laughs> okay, and Wolfgang is also giving a guest lecture today as part of the InfoBiz course. I guess you're going to be there and I hope to see you. Thank you. Thank you.